Let us pray. Our Father, we're asking that you'll give us the grace to follow you to the end and we'll be servants under you as the master and that you will give us all that we need that we may be able to do everything you want us to do. Help us to be faithful. In Jesus' name we pray. The message we want to consider now is a message concerning the good fight of faith. The good fight of faith. From First Timothy chapter 6 verse 12. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. There are many Christians that feel that words like fight struggle, strive, labor, that those words have no place in the Christian life. The attitude they have of the Christian life is the attitude of flowing down with the stream, never having anything to restrict anything to resist or anything to restrain. But as you find out in the Bible, you will discover that from the earliest times, people of God have been involved in a fight. And the fight still continues. And in this passage I've read to you, it says, fight the good fight of faith. So you still need to understand that in your Christian life, there is a place, a necessary place, a conspicuous place for wrestling, for fighting, for striving. And so you should not be like the Christians who feel that now they have become Christians. They have become born again. And therefore they do not have any use or any need to struggle or to wrestle. Other people have recognized the necessity of fighting the good fight of faith. But they have taken everything completely out of context. The context in which they have put their own fight of faith is that faith brings healing. Faith brings prosperity. Faith brings material things. And if there is any idea that brings doubt in your mind as to your own claim to healing and prosperity, Resist that idea. Anything that will tell you that as a Christian, you should accept sickness or poverty as a way of life, resist it. Because that is the devil trying to cheat you out of the promises you ought to claim by faith. For them, that is all they understand about the good fight of faith. But it's much more than that. One you will see that over here in the context of this passage I've read to you, the passage, if you look at it from verse 6, it says, But godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain that we can carry nothing out. 
and having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith, and they have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things, and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Then it says, fight the good fight of faith. You can see here that the apostle was not talking about healing. He was not talking about satisfying your covetousness. In fact, what the apostle is saying here is this, that the love of money and the love for material things of the world and the love to amass the things that will bring pleasure in the world, the heart that is running after plenty, that it is very dangerous to the life of faith. It says, the more of these things you have, the more you will forget, we brought nothing into this world. And they that will give chance to the covetousness that is coming up within them, the desire to be rich, they fall into temptation and in a snare. Then it says you have an enemy within you. That enemy within you is in your flesh, is in your mind, is in your heart. He will try to make you to run after having the things of the world and to forget heaven. And that that enemy must be fought because it is going to destroy your real faith and your true faith. And so the apostle says, first of all, the fight you will fight is a fight against the giant in you, against the tempter in you against the tendency in you to follow after the customs and the lines of thinking in this world. The fight that we're talking about here is the fight of faith that begins at the moment you want to become a Christian. At the moment you want to become a Christian, the voice of Christ is calling you. The gate of heaven or the gate of the kingdom is ahead of you. And you want to enter. But there are a lot of things that are pulling you back. The old girlfriend, the old boyfriend, the devil himself, friends in the world, relatives in the world. A lot of people that will be discouraging you and will be telling you if you give yourself fully to the Lord, you are going to face a life of misery, a life of sadness. If you give yourself to the Lord at your age, as you are now, how are you going to enjoy the world? Then you remember the words of Jesus Christ, that from the time of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of God sovereign violence, and the violent take it by force. That's where you start the fighting. The good fight of faith. There will be things that will try to pull you back. There will be things that will be telling you, you cannot make that restitution. There will be things that will be telling you, you cannot repent of that sin. There will be things that will be telling you, you cannot give your whole life to the Lord like that. Keep it cool, moderate. You're wanting to rush into the center of the Christian faith. That's where your fighting begins. You fight against every idea, every temptation, everything that will pull you back from entering into the kingdom of God. Then do you remember the words of Jesus Christ that says, strive to enter in, into the narrow, ga into the narrow gate. Because many are seeking to enter, they will not be able to enter. Strive, that's the fight. When you strive with somebody, you are fighting with that person, you are wrestling with that person, that is the beginning of the fight of the good faith. The faith, the saving faith, to bring you into the kingdom of God, the things that will pull you back, 
the thing that will withdraw your attention from it. Fight the good fight of faith. And even after you have entered into the narrow gate, there will be things that will be bringing to your remembrance what you left back in Egypt. Don't you remember that every time the children of Israel came across a difficulty on the way to the land of Canaan, they will say, we remember the onion. We remember the cucumber. We remember all the garlics that we took when we were in Egypt. And in your life like that, a few times, when you come across a difficulty in your Christian life, when you come across some strain or stress in the journey, when you come across some problems in the ministry, in the work of the Lord, the devil will not fail to bring back to your mind, if you are still in the world, if you were still in Egypt, these are the things that you could have been enjoying. That is the time you will arise and fight. You will fight your very body. You will fight your own very mind. You will fight every suggestion, every idea that will turn you back to Egypt. That is the good fight of faith. Everybody has to be involved in such a fight. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27, But I keep my body under, and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a cast away. My sister, you have been the second wife in a home. In a home, do you add a car to yourself? You add a driver. You add a cook. You add the people that could sweep the floor, clean the floor. You add times of entertainment. You add entertainment allowance from that man that you call your husband. Eventually, you heard the gospel. As you heard the gospel, you gave your life to the Lord. Maybe it wasn't easy. It was a fight all through the way. Because you thought, how will I tell this man? You had to fight with that. You thought, how will I be able to clean up my past? You had to fight with that. Eventually, you strove to the point that you pulled it through. You became a believer. And eventually now, you made restitution. After the restitution, you who had a whole palace to yourself, you had a boy's quarter, you had visitor's room, you have messenger, you have driver, you have vehicle. Now, the man said if you are going to make restitution, all right, you can go. Somebody wants to make you poor. Somebody wants to make you mediocre in life. And they are telling you all this uh, thing that has made you crazy. You want to go? Okay, you can go. And you went with a little portmanteau. No cook, no driver, no car, nothing at all. While you are there living in a single room, you feel as if you are in a prison because you have been in a palace before. Before, all the stereo, all the television, all the air condition, you cannot even afford single fan now. And now, the devil will come and say, the man still has the door open for you. Won't you go back? That's when you need to fight. The ideas will come to your mind. The impressions will come to your mind. This is the good fight of faith. Because this sin now, all those suggestions will like to take heaven from you. Will like to take the possibility of being intimate with the Lord from you. It will try to give you absent-mindedness when you are praying. When you have to pray for even a meal. Whereas before, everything will be set on the table. Before you will go on night, um, night ceremony, on days and that. Before you had all the contact with all the business friends of this man you called your husband. But now you have made restitution. All that is cut off. The devil will try to say, why not choose a captain, get some friends, go and beg that man and go back to Egypt. That's the time of fighting. And you fight by prayer. Not canal weapons. You go on your knees, you fight it through. You put your body under. You're not fighting anybody. 
You are fighting the bent within your heart, the disposition within your heart, the tendency within your heart to want to go back to the place where you have come out, where you have said good night that I will never come there again. The devil is trying to say, why can't you go back there? Or it may be, friend, you have been part of the gang of robbers before. And easy money, cheap money came in. But now you have made restitution and you have repented. To make that restitution, all the money you amassed before, you had to bring all the money out to make the restitution. Even the land you had got in a dubious way, you had to sell that land, you had to sell the house up to make restitution to the people you have stolen from and cheated. And now you who had all the easy money before that you got from highway robbery, now you are a Christian, you are a child of God. And now you have to depend on God alone. You don't even have shoe, just slippers, just a shirt, just a pair of trousers. Whereas before, when you were in the night business, money came in out of the street, out of the road, blood money, and you were spending like anything. But now times have changed. You are now a believer. You cannot do that again. And your mind will be telling you, are you going to stay like this? Your mind will be saying, go back to your trade. Because you didn't know things will be like this. You need a change of life, a change of lifestyle, because you cannot eat what you were eating before. You cannot drink what you were drinking before. You cannot spend money the way you were spending money before. Your mind will say, why will you not go back? That's the time you will fight, the good fight of faith. And it says, according to what Paul the Apostle himself said he did, he said, I keep my body under. It was a fight. It was a struggle. It was real wrestling and striving. And it says, to bring my body under subjection. He said he needed to do that so that after preaching to others, he himself will not be cast away, which means even apostle still needs to be involved in that fight. It's a personal fight. A personal fight. You recognize that your enemy is living within your flesh living within your brain, living in, on your eyes, living on your mind. And because of that enemy that will do everything he could ever do to send you back to where you are coming from, you say, I will put this body under. I will fight this fight. If I fight dying, I know I've died for a good cause. And it says, while I preach to other people, I myself will not be a cast away. Not only that, in your own personal life, there are things to fight that may not be known to the closest person to you. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. Unless I should be exalted above measure. Through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. The point here is this. The Apostle Paul had seen great, great revelations of paradise, of the third heaven, he had heard melody, singing, voices, or trances out of the third heaven that it was impossible for him to relate to anybody. They were incredible, unbelievable. The joy of the world to come. The glory of Christ. The mystery of the kingdom of God. The enjoyment of pleasure in the presence of the angels. And the stars that will be in his crown. He saw it all. And the glory was so much that even for an apostle, the normal thing would be that he'll be exalted above measure. Because of that, God allowed a messenger of Satan to buffet him. It was a fight. 
to deal blow after blow upon him. That man, he had more enemies than any other apostles. The Greeks, the philosophers, the pagans, the magicians, the sorcerers, they were all his enemies. The people persecuted him in various ways. They even developed new methods of persecuting that man. He said, on the way, the robbers were there waiting for him. He said, on the sea, the shipwreck. He said, by the Jews, the club on one hand, the whip on the other hand. He said, in the prison, they had a permanent place for him. He came in and out, in and out. Of the false brethren, they were not a few. They just, they were all around him. As the Jews were buffeting him, the robbers also were waylaying him. As he escaped that, there was a snake waiting at the, in the midst of the sick to fasten itself on that man's hand. He said it was a fight. It was all, the whole of hell brought all these together to send me back. To say, why, why is it all like this? Why am I going to face all this? But he said, I had to fight it out. And that's what you have to fight out persecutors, yes, they will be there. Problems, yes, they will be there. And they will deal blow after blow. And when messenger of Satan deals a blow, it's a real blow. It is not something you will say, no, I don't mind at all. In fact, he minded so much, he prayed three times. He said, Lord, you must take this away. And when he prayed the first time and said, God, Take this away so that I can have the liberty and the freedom to just concentrate on preaching. I don't want problems. Nobody wants problems. Much it's there. I don't want all this fighting, all this buffeting. Help me take it out so that I can concentrate on just the preaching of the gospel alone. God said, no, Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. Keep on in the fight. I'm behind you. Then he waited for some time. And then when the blow became more intense and more serious, and the struggle and the striving and the fighting became almost unbearable, and it was becoming tired, he went back to God again, wondering whether God would have changed his mind. God removed this, and God said, Do you know what I told you the first time you prayed? Leave it there, that messenger of Satan, all those uh, people that are persecuting. Paul, you need it. You've got so much revelation that if you don't have those blows upon you, dealing up day after day on you. Paul, you'll not be able to get to that place you saw. The glory is too much for you to bear. And all the beauty and the glory of heaven that you have seen, it will make an ordinary fellow proud if you don't have those messengers of Satan buffeting you, blowing you, blow after blow. So he said, my grace is sufficient for you. So he went on preaching and praying again on other things. But then the messenger of Satan blowed him and just gave him another blow, more than he ever got before. And he strove with all the grace, with all the strength, with all the gift, with all the ability, with all the resistance in him. And again he felt that this is too much. Maybe God will change his mind this time. The third time he went to God and said, God, how about it now? Can you take this messenger of Satan away? He said, Paul, you need it. I know your need. Paul, you need it. If I knew that you didn't need it, I wouldn't have allowed it there. A minute, you need it, Paul. Because of those revelations, because of the power of God in your life, because of the authority and the command, if I remove that thing from you completely, in one week, you'll become another man. Paul, you are best in the best stage. Why you have that messenger of Satan buffeting you? And so he said, then after that third time, he didn't pray about it anymore. He said, now I rejoice in infirmities. I rejoice in weaknesses. I rejoice in all those difficulties so that when I am weak, then I am strong. I just resign myself to the overall wisdom of the Almighty God. He knows that in this life, if there is no fight to fight, I'll become careless. If there are no tears to weep, I'll become careless. If there are no difficulties to surmount, I'll become careless. 
if with all the glories I've seen, this messenger of Satan had been totally taken away, God said, it will not be good for me. Therefore, I rejoice in all that. Look at verse 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 8. For this sin, I besought the Lord thrice, three times, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in mine infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, now, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. You see, brothers and sisters, we must fight the good fight of faith in your own life. You'll find some things that are trying to creep in into your life. And you must not just relax on the rocking chair and say, Christ is my Savior. I have no fight to fight. He is the one that will fight all the fight for me. I've given my life to the Lord Jesus Christ. All that I'm supposed to do now is sing amazing grace. How great God is, is more than that. You'll fight. You will fight the enemies within. But not only that. You need also to fight enemies without. Enemies without. What the enemies without will try to do is to take the most important thing in your life. And that is the very word of God that you have. The very word of God that you have. The enemies will try to take everything away from you. But then you must fight that in Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. And that because of false brethren, unawares brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that we might, they might bring us into bondage, to whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour that the truth of the gospel might continue in you. Are you a pastor? Are you a preacher? Are you an area leader? Are you a zonal leader? You will need to fight for the good faith. The faith of our fathers living still. In spite of dungeon and imprisonment, yet we stand on that word, the word of God which stands forever. There will be false brethren that will try to come in into the fold unawares. And they will major on the love of the brethren. They will major on loving one another. They will major on nobody has the total truth. They will major on you only have part of the truth we have part of the truth. They will major on you alone as a single pastor will not be able to edify the whole church, the whole local church. They will tell your people that your pastor alone cannot do it. He needs us. With the addition and insight and revelation we have so that the whole church, the local church, will have the fullness of thing that will edify them. And in that way, they will, in a subtle, clever manner, bring in false doctrine. What will the preacher do? The preacher who doesn't know there is anything called contention, fighting, striving, disputation. The preacher who feels that, well, I will never argue. All I will do, I will preach what I know. And they are carrying on false doctrine there. Well, I, I can't fight. Because now I'm a Christian, I have the mind of Christ. I'll never struggle with anybody. I'll never strive with anybody. 
The people that want to take false doctrine, I know that doctrine is false. If they take it, that's their problem because as a child of God, I must never argue, I must never dispute, I must never strive, I must never fight. But such people, they don't know the Bible. Over here, Paul the Apostle said, I won a battle in my own personal life. That enemy within me, I fought that enemy. And until I can see now, a crown of righteousness is laid up for me. I have fought a good fight. I've laid hold on eternal life. Right now, the Lord is awaiting me with a crown of righteousness. He fought in his personal life. He will not allow sin to enter in his personal life. But there's a second stage of fighting. Fighting the good fight of faith. The false brethren, the people that may know how to say hallelujah or praise the Lord or whatever, the people that will say, I'm a prophet also like you are. I'm a Christian also like you are. I'm a minister of God also like you are. And they bring in erroneous doctrine so that the children of God will come back into bondage, bondage into sin. You know what the apostle said? He said in verse 5, he said, they came to spy out our liberty, our freedom, our freedom from sin. We're no more under Satan, under that tyranny. And they came to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage, into the bondage of circumcision, into the bondage of Judaism, into the bondage of false doctrine, the things that have been abolished by Christ. These false brethren wanted to reactivate it, resurrect it, so that the followers of Christ and the converts of Paul will go back into the bondage of the Mosaic law. He said in verse 5, To whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour. That's a militant soldier. He spied, he caught sight of those people that were peddling false doctrine. Coming from the gate, he stationed people at the gate of the church. He said, we're not going to give them chance, not even for one hour. He diverted all his preaching to knocking that thing until everybody knew that this man Paul the Apostle was knocking something. And he gave a whole epistle to the Galatians to, it, to knock it out completely. Not like many preachers today who say, well, I just want to preach a positive message. I don't want to knock anything. You'll never work for God. I don't want to knock what other people are doing. I just preach my own. You will never work for God. You must knock every false doctrine out of the premises of your church. The Jehovah's Witnesses bring all their materials and they are selling them. They are selling those materials in front of your church. You will never knock something. All your converts will backslide. They will go into watchtower error. The people the of occultism, they bring the books of the Psalms in, around your premises of your church. You say, well, I will never knock anything. I will never speak against anyone or anything. I just preach my own message. You will never be able to do the work successfully. There is a fight to fight. A fight to fight. Some people want to make your church a business, a place. And all they are doing is that all the things we are doing, the logo of deeper life, they will put it on a singlet, they will put it on a bag, they will put it on a shoe, and they will be selling to people, and they want to turn your church to a market. You cannot take a whip like Jesus did and drive all of them out of your premises. You say, well, I cannot fight. Then you are not like Jesus. What do you think of Jesus as he came and took a whip? And he didn't even say, well, Peter, I am I'm the son of God. I cannot do this, this one. Well, if they see the son of God doing this, what will they think? If they see the Messiah, Christ doing this, what will they think? But Peter, John, James, sons of Bonaji, sons of fire, sons of thunder, you go and do it for me. You can do it, but I can do it. I'm the gentle, loving, meek Jesus. No, that's not the idea. He himself, he took the wheel. He drove all of them out. He said, 
Make not my father's house a house of merchandise, a den of thieves and robbers. That's what you are to do. When you see those people that are bringing erroneous doctrines in, or when you see people that say they're having a crusade, and there is an adulterer, there is a polygamist that is preaching there, there is a false prophet that is preaching there, and then they come to your church premises on your Friday, Miracle Revival Hour, or Wednesday or Thursday, and they're distributing your handbill, and you saw it, everybody has got it. Well, you say, if I talk now, they will say I don't have any love. But you see, as a person that has love in my heart, I will leave them. I'll be praying for them that God will not allow them to get into error. You are not a servant of God. You fear people. You cannot fight. Fight the good fight of faith. He said, to whom we gave space or place by subjection, no, not for an hour. That the truth of the gospel might continue with you. That's why we fight those false doctrines. So that the truth of the gospel will remain in you. In Titus chapter 1 from verse 9 holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers those are the people that are arguing that they search the scripture in your church you have taught the people and now because we have opportunity of asking questions, somebody rises up and he begins to preach instead of asking a question. And he's trying to deceive the innocent, weak, young people who do not know the word of God. And they just say, well, you can sit down. Already has planted some seed of error, seed of confusion. And seed that will blow the people away and make them not to fully trust in Christ anymore. Already he has punctured a hole in the doctrine of holiness and in the teaching on restitution. And after he has spoiled everything, you said, well, I have a message to pray today and I must still preach that message. Cast that message aside and deal with the present problem. And say, man, keep on standing. I'll deal with it and deal with you as well. And then you can take one hour, you can take one and a half hours and deal with that thing until everybody that listens to you that Sunday morning will know that that person that stood up to ask a question did not know the truth. Until the whole church will join you in fighting that man, fighting the error in that man. Either I will bow down and say God is in this place indeed or I will run out and never come back again. That's fighting. Fighting the good fight of faith. And this church, oh, we fought like that years ago. In our retreats, all those people that were coming in our retreats, they came from various directions. And they asked questions. You asked them, we fought them. Some of them, they became converted and they stayed. And they never will forget. When somebody has fought against you, and you almost knock your joints out of place and almost pull your body apart. If you surrender eventually and you become his friend, you will never insult him. You will always respect him. <laughs> you say, that man, you almost killed me. And the people in our retreats that came before and we gave them the word of God, those of them that were converted, well, they said, this is the place where there is Bible. We achieved that name by fighting. If you want to achieve that same glory and that same name, you will have to fight. The other people that did not surrender, that did not get converted, they never came again. They knew that's not a place you can plant anything. Oh, they say deeper life. They don't take any other person's doctrine. They say deeper life is just Bible, Bible all the time. They say Bible and no love. They are right. We didn't show them any love when they tried to plant evil in our midst. We didn't show them anything. We fought. We fought. And we fought. And they ran away. And thank God we don't see them again. I mean the old ones. But the new ones are still coming in. 
and when they come in you fight again they will tell the other people that deeper life is not a place to dump your false doctrine am i right that's how to do it and it says over here in verse 10 for there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers specifically day of the circumcision whose mouth must be stopped their mouths must be stopped friends that's christian fighting that is fighting the good fight of faith they subvert whole houses teaching things that they ought not for filthy lucas sake and then in verse 13 this witness is true wherefore rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith so this is the fighting that the bible talks about that you fight against every form of evil a bible study let me just show you this reference and then we can pray all the other references i would have read they go along the same line but i believe you know this truth already in deuteronomy chapter 13 Deuteronomy chapter 13 from verse 1 if there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and giveth thee a sign or a wonder and the sign or the wonder come to pass whereof he spake unto thee saying let us go after other gods which thou hast not known and let us serve them thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams for the lord your god proveth you to know whether ye love the lord your god with all your heart and with all your soul ye shall walk after the lord your god and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice and ye shall serve him and cleave unto him and that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he has spoken to turn you away from the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you out of the house of bondage to trust thee out of the way, which the Lord thy God commanded thee to walk in. So shalt thou put evil away from the midst of thee. What this is saying is that if anyone brings false doctrine to you that will turn you away from the good way of the Lord that the Lord has told you to walk in it says you will count him as dead you will so fight with him and separate from him that it's like he has died in the Old Testament literally they will stone them in the New Testament we don't stone them but we just count them as good as dead and we forget about them we do not remain with people that bring false doctrine into our houses in verse 6 if thy brother the son of thy mother or thy son or thy daughter or the wife of thy bosom or thy friend which is as thine own soul entice thee secretly saying let us go and serve other gods which thou hast not known thou nor thy fathers namely the gods of the people which are round about you nice unto thee or far from thee from one end of the earth even to the other end of the earth thou shalt not consent unto him nor hearken unto him neither shall thine eye pity him neither shall thou spare neither shall thou conceal him but thou shalt surely kill him thine hand shall be forced upon him to put him to death afterwards the hand of all the people and thou shalt stone him with stones that he die because he has sought to thrust thee away from the lord thy god which brought thee out of the land of egypt from the house of bondage and all israel shall hear and fear and shall do no more any such wickedness as this is among you so you can see the fight from the old testament times you are not to give any space at all any space at all to false doctrine 
And remember, you start the fighting in your own very life. Anything that will thrust you out of the kingdom of God, anything that will discourage you, anything that will be a problem to you and pull you back to Egypt, fight that thing. In um, Acts chapter 15, verses 1 and 2. And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no, more, no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and the elders about this question. You see, that was fighting. But it's fighting the good fight of faith. And when Paul and Barnabas could not subdue the people completely, they came back to the headquarters. They came back to Jerusalem that all the apostles and all the elders will get involved in the fighting. That's what to be done. Any false doctrine that comes, you fight against it yourself. You see that you fight against it as a zonal leader, as a coordinator, as a local pastor in a local government area, and you are not able to trash that thing, and you are not able to bury that thing, bring it to the state capital, and let all the leaders and all the teachers of the word of God fight it in the whole state. You see that the thing is still spreading, and they will not get rid of that false doctrine. Bring it over here to the national level. We fight against it until every false doctrine is buried from our midst. This church will be kept pure. The word of God will remain intact in this church. We are not going to allow anybody to add anything to the word of God or to take anything away from the word of God. And we're all going to join in the fighting. You fight any enemy that is trying to lead you back into the world. Any temptation, any problem, any desire that is going to pull you back into the world. That's your personal fight. But the national fight, the congregational fight, is when we all, in agreement together, fight against every form of false doctrine. Rise up and make up your mind. You will fight against anything and everything that will get you back to the world. You are not a slave of Satan anymore. You are not a child of the devil anymore. The Lord has called you. And he says, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold.